Good morning and welcome to your living room or wherever you are. <laughs> wherever you are gathered in the name of Jesus, that's where Jesus is this morning. So let's worship him together with everything that we are. The Bible says we should love the Lord our God with all of our soul, with all of our heart, with all of our strength. And that means with everything that we are, we worship him. So let's do that together. Amen.
I've heard of wonders and ancient mysteries The things of heaven my eyes have never seen I want to know it Would you make it real for me? I've seen the stories the faith and I believe You're still your story Yeah. 
into the throne room and fall down at your feet won't waste a moment for you've come to set me Good morning. Uh, thanks, worship team. That was wonderful. It's at these moments that you kind of wish that the, the hall was full of people and uh, everybody singing together, but I trust that you were singing at home. Thanks again. Um, just a few announcements for today. Um, this Thursday is Remembrance Day, November the 11th, so the office will be closed. It's a, it's a holiday. Um, just be aware of that. Um, then just a few things to pray about, please. Uh, the first one is that um, we are in the final stages of the grant application. Um, the application is open and our deadline is the 13th. And so we have been really busy. And um, you, know, you kind of think, well, how could that be so busy? I was explaining to the guys praying this morning that You'll get a form with 50 questions. And question number seven says, will you be implementing this policy to help parents with lower income and then applying for government subsidy for that? And you say yes or no. Um, it's not that simple because that question then has a, a form. It has a whole lot of research just to answer that one question. Then the next question Will you implement a policy of this or that? Then you've got to read the policy, 20 pages, and then make a decision. So it's pretty complicated, um, but the, quote, the quotes for the building are coming together. That's great, but uh, we really need to pray that uh, God would show us favor in all of this. Um, there are a few tricky questions that uh, we need to navigate, and we really just need God's wisdom on exactly how to word that and put that across um, you know, we're talking about a project of about $1.4 million. Um, the government gives up to $1.5 million. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's a big project, so just pray about that this week, please. Um, and then uh, Saturday the 13th, this coming Saturday, uh, is our elders' planning time. So we get together as an eldership team, we spend the day together, and um, we plan for next year. And uh, we want to hear God. It's, it's great to have good plans. And uh, we want to come out there with a good framework that we can work within, uh, but also be flexible to hear what the Holy Spirit says to us and how He guides us. I think that's obviously the most important. And then today uh, will be our first venture out to Buckridge. For those that don't know where that is, it's down West Fraser. Uh, it's other side where the road has washed away. So it does mean a, quite a big detour, um, so it is a commitment, and we'll be sending a team down there once a month. We have a team, so if you're keen to be part of that, um, in six months' time, we'll, we'll relook at the whole thing, and then maybe you can be part of that team. But we want to, there needs to be a sense of continuity where we have uh, teams going in, and then when they go again the next month, there's at least some familiar faces, especially for people in that area. And so uh, we'll be at uh, Dave and Rosie Wall's house. They've opened their home to us. And, uh, yeah, it'll be great. So the first team goes out today, this afternoon. So uh, just keep us in your prayers if you don't mind. It'll be great. We want to see the Great Commission fulfilled everywhere. It's your neighborhood and the nations and the neighborhoods next door and everything in between. And so that includes Buckridge. All right. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for an opportunity to look at your word, to learn, to grow, to mature, uh, to pick up your heart for us uh, and for those around us. And Lord, I pray that we would hear what the Spirit has to say this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, I'm, uh, I'm launching again into, uh, into the seeking of truth. I think this is my 24th message. Some of those would have been A and B, so who knows, it could be about number 30. We've been going along with this for a while. I think what happens is that we, 
we start to speak about truth and we start to challenge those things that are not truth. And what it does is it almost squeezes out those things that are hidden, that aren't truth, that are very uncomfortable to live with when we all of a sudden find ourselves in conflict with what the Word of God says. And it's hard to let go of things that we've been used to. It's hard to let go of things that we would prefer. It's also hard to let go of things that seem nice. And it's not that God's not nice. He's, he's the most wonderful being in all of the universe. Uh, but He's also truth. And so for us, it's very important that we stick to what God says. And uh, that's what I want to do this morning. Um, John eight thirty one to 32 says, To the Jews who had believed Him, Jesus said, If you hold to My teachings... Then you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. We want to be free. But ultimately we are free when we hold to the teachings of Jesus. Now that includes the teachings of, of the Bible. Uh, Jesus taught from the Old Testament. There were also those that were inspired by the Holy Spirit to, to put truth, to pen, a pen to paper, so that we can enjoy that today because Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'll leave you somebody who's going to lead and guide you and comfort you, called the Holy Spirit, and uh, He will guide you into all truth. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we have the New Testament written. So, what I want to speak about today is something that I think every single one of us has been guilty of, and I trust will no longer be guilty of in the future. All right, so now that's interesting. I hope I got your attention. And that's getting involved where we shouldn't. Getting involved where we shouldn't. And this includes conflict, it includes gossip, and it's one of those things that we actually need to speak about. Um, we don't like to talk about it, because sometimes it's tough, but, well, for those of you who know me, that's not a reason not to speak about things. If you are a Christian, then you've been born into a battle zone. Um, not against people, against principalities and powers. Um, the kingdom of darkness, and when a battle comes our way, we need to determine where it comes from so we can determine how to respond to it. Um, possibly it's God's battle, and we don't need to fight it at all. Sometimes we get involved where we shouldn't. It could legitimately be ours, and then we better fight it because it's coming our way and it's ours to fight, otherwise we've lost before we've started. It could be somebody else's battle, and then we definitely need to stay out of it. And it could be nobody's battle, and our involvement will just be a distraction. So, I'm going to have a look at the book of Nehemiah, just as an introduction, and then I'm going to have a look at what Jesus said. And um, I did a series on Nehemiah, and I'm actually pretty keen to do it again. I really enjoyed that series, and it's about the restoration of the gates and the walls of Jerusalem. Um, Nehemiah was working for a king, and he went off and he uh, um, and uh, he went and rebuilt these these gates. But um, so he he faced some opposition. There were challenges. There were all sorts of things happening because there were people that didn't want these gates and these walls rebuilt. And so, in this context, he led his people with great wisdom and discernment. And I believe that we can learn some lessons from what he did. So Nehemiah chapter 4. So I'll be reading a portion from chapter 4 and a portion from chapter 6. So Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 13 to 16. So they were coming under attack. They, were, they heard that there was a threat, a physical threat to them while they were rebuilding the walls. So Nehemiah gives this report. He said, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall, at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, and your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Um, there's a time that when the battle comes directly to us that we do need to fight. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. 
From that day on, half my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. So many of the battles that we fight are in direct opposition to what we are building. Now what we are building can be multifaceted. It can be a daycare. It can be a relationship with somebody else. Um, it, it, can be, it can be in many different levels. But many are just distractions. And the aim of the distraction is to stop us building. To stop us building. Remember last week I said we're good is the enemy of best. Where we start building something and it's just a distraction. There's something that we get involved in that takes us off the wall and it shouldn't. So let's have a look at Nehemiah chapter 6 and uh, see how Nehemiah dealt with distractions as opposed to just direct attacks. Now the direct attacks we can talk about on another day. Um, I, would, I would suggest you have a look at the, the armor of God and uh, that's, that is very well documented for us and every one of those pieces of armor has some significance for us in our fight against um, the forces of evil. But a distraction is a whole lot more subtle. It's something that just distracts us. You know, somebody once said that if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. Think about that just for a moment. We might say to ourselves, well, I live a pretty good life. You know, I'm not involved in this sin or that sin, whatever, but I'm extremely busy. Sometimes the devil does that as well. And uh, he puts us in places where we get distracted from building the wall, which represents for us the kingdom. So Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 1 to 4. When word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors in the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message. So they, they tried the direct attack approach. They were ready. They had the full armor of God or the weapons that they had. And so the enemy decided, well, I'm going to do something else. If I can't get them, if I can't beat them there, I'm going to distract them from the task that they're busy with. He sent this message, come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should I stop work while I leave it? Um, and go down to you. Four times they sent the same message, and each time I gave them the same answer. So Nehemiah distinguished between those attacks that required an active response and those that needed to be ignored. And so often we get distracted from these things. The enemy threatened them directly, but they were prepared, and then the enemy tried to trick them into leaving their work. See, Nehemiah knew what God had called him to. And in our context, it's seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. That's the truth of God's word. See, he discerned and he judged each issue with this purpose in mind, saying that, is this what I've been called to do? Over the last two weeks, they, I, I myself ha, uh, lost focus about a particular thing. And I'm not going to go into it because otherwise it becomes a long discussion. But the reality is I had to ask myself, that was this what I was called to as, as part of extending the kingdom? And the answer was yes. And said, why aren't you involved in that anymore? I said, well, okay, I should be because that was the reason for it. And the Holy Spirit gave me a slap up the side of the head and off we go. We've learned, we learned and uh, made adjustment and uh, we move on because we have to be open to what he's telling us. Our topic for the day is conflict and gossip. Conflict and gossip. Something that the devil throws in our way to get us to come off the wall and stop building what he's called us to build. Where we get involved in those conflicts and those things where we are not called to be involved. In Proverbs 26 verse 20 it says, Without, a wood, without wood a fire goes out, without gossip a quarrel dies down. And it's true. So often conflict between... Christians falls into this category of distraction. Distraction from the task we've been called to complete. Sometimes people get offended. They up, they leave the church, 
the task that they've been given in the church is now incomplete. They've been distracted because of something that has offended them. We call to love and to prefer one another. As soon as we gossip, that task remains incomplete because now we've stopped preferring, we've stopped loving. That's what we have been called to do as, as, as an integral part of our relationship and our, and our faith. Sometimes we get involved in something that is meant for somebody else. And it becomes a distraction and it impacts the task that we've been called to do. So today I want to, I want to speak about truth, not preference, not past practice, not teaching by micromanaging leaders. Perhaps you've been in a in a situation where you've been led by a leader that micromanages and they want to know everything that's going on, I want to have a look at what the Word of God says, and um, we're going we're gonna to live on that. And if, you, if during, if during the, the message you find something that you've been guilty of, let me, let me help you with that. Repent, move on, and follow the way of truth in the future. As easy as that. There, there doesn't need to be a long counseling session. There, there, if, if, if something needs to be worked out with somebody else, we first, we first ask God's forgiveness, then we go to that person, we work it out, and then we move on, and we just we make an adjustment for the future. And so it's quick, it's easy. No, sometimes not so easy, but it's quick and it needs to be done. And so uh, uh, this is what the Word of God tells us. All right. So the first thing I wanted to have a look at was just leadership involvement. Some people believe that if they have something against somebody else, and they are obviously right, obviously they are right, then leaders should back them. They should get the backing of the leadership. But the Bible teaches something else. Um, this is a battle that leaders actually stay out of. And I'm going to explain. Most conflict resolution in the church doesn't involve leaders at all. Not at all. Even correction due to sin is mostly the responsibility of the people in the church and not the leaders. Some of you are saying, that's not true. And I'm saying, well, I'll just read the Bible. We're going to have a look at what the Bible says. So when something involves church government or discipline or doctrinal matters, yes, then the eldership gets involved. That's what our responsibility is. But most time, it's up to the individuals involved to actually resolve the conflict themselves without anybody else knowing about it. So, let's have a look at Matthew chapter 18. There's three verses. I'm going to have a look at the three verses separately. We're going to speak about them. Now, I know there's other verses. I know there's other verses that say that if you're there praying and you think that you think of something that you held against somebody else, go and work it out with them. There's other scriptures in in the epistles that explain what do we do when people sin and rebuking them publicly and then having nothing more to do with them and all of those things. And those things are valid and they are true, but that is, that is an entire series. I, I want to have a look at this one scripture and how does this apply to us because the kernel of reconciliation is right here. So Matthew chapter 18. If your brother sins against you, now we're using male terms, just get over it. I'm happy to be the bride. Uh, we can all be brothers and assume that we're sisters as well. Okay. So if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. Man, it, it's like, I, I'm not sure that I could put it clearer than that. It's like if he sins against you, if somebody does something wrong against you, Go to them. Point out their fault. Say to them, this is what you did. Just between the two of you. You see, when one believer sins against another believer, he's writing to believers here. When one believer sins against another believer, there's no mention of a third party in the beginning. There's no one. There's no one else. There's no one involved. So often we want to bounce it off somebody. We want to get a perspective. Even our spouse. So somebody offends me. Somebody sins against me. I go home to Lisa and I say, you know what, you know what uh, this guy did? 
the Bible says something different. It, I, I don't know how else to explain that. Yes, but we want flesh. Okay, now, now we're just playing semantics so that I can gossip. That, that's really what we're doing. Let's be honest about it. It says here, between the two of you. Okay? I want to talk to a close friend. I want to speak to my parent perhaps. Perhaps you're a teenager and you're watching this. Somebody sins against you. If, you. if you're a Christian and that person's a Christian, this is what applies to you. You go to that person by yourself and you try to work that thing out. Some people will go onto social media and they'll complain. Some other people will use veiled language and they say, well, I want to tell you the story just so you can give me a perspective. There was a, a certain man that offended me. We're seeking justification for our offense. Then what happens is we solidify our opinion of the situation because we've already called in another witness. So when we go to the person that we're trying to work it out with, our heart is no longer as soft as what it was in the beginning. Because now what has happened, another opinion has agreed with us because they've only heard our side of the story. We have found justification. No, we want to be free. You see, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. See, we hold to his teaching, not to what is comfortable, not to what, is, what we think is the right thing to do. Now, we're talking about sin issues here. All right, we're talking about sin. It's not talking about, talking about good things about people and so on. It doesn't mean you never talk about people. Of course we do. We, we, we're involved with other people. So the first step is we go to that person, number one, to show them what we think is their fault. And we say, this is, this is what I believe you have done. The second one is to build or repair the bridge of covenant. That has to be the motivation. This is not to justify ourselves. This is not to get somebody to grovel in front of us. It's none of that. It says there, then you have won your brother over. It's to repair the relationship. We go. I'm going to pause on that word go. Because it actually says go. It doesn't say write. It also doesn't say phone. Now I know there were no phones in the time. But I think that there's something about sitting face to face with somebody where we can. We, we, are, we are intricate beings. There, there is validity in body language. There, there is validity in tears, in, in facial expressions. There's validity in a hug, in holding a hand, in asking forgiveness. All of those things are done in person. Now, sometimes it's not possible. Sometimes we have to do it differently. If it's somebody that's living in... England, and we've got to work this thing out, then try to have a video conference or do something else that you can kind of work this thing out. Uh, but try our best to, to do it in person. We go with reconciliation in mind. We go in love. We go with soft hearts. We go with open ears. That has to be the thing because otherwise we look at it as these are the cold, hard steps of conflict resolution as ordained by Jesus. And that's not it. Jesus gave us these guidelines because they actually work when motivated by love. We should be able to say, in all honesty, besides God, I have spoken to nobody else about this. We should be able to say that. If we haven't, we haven't stuck to what Jesus has taught. And guess what? Then we're not fully free. That's the end result of it. There's a part that we bound. And so, and so this, is, this is something we need to do. If the person responds positively, and I want to say that 99% of the time, I don't have statistics, I'm just throwing that out there. Most of the time, it's a misunderstanding. Most of the time, it's like, say for example, here's a, here's a great example. Um, I, I was accused once of not greeting somebody. And I, I, was, I was walking across the road, and somebody honked their horn, and I was like, why are they honking their horn? The light's red for them, you know? It's what, and I carried on walking. The person said, you didn't even greet me. 
I, I even honked the horn at you to greet you. And I didn't know who the person was. I didn't recognize their car. It was purely a misunderstanding. If, if I had said, you know what, I knew it was you, and, I, and, and I, just, I just felt embarrassed to know you as a friend, or I, I didn't want to greet you or whatever, I am sorry, then I've resolved the issue. But most of the time, it's a misunderstanding. But if it's a real thing, and you, and you can work that out amongst each other, just, it's just the way it is. And so if, if, it's, if they respond positively, and it's all sorted out, then nobody else is involved ever. It's done. It's history. We move on. The, the relationship has been healed. This is how Jesus teaches us. He teaches us the truth. And I believe this is how conflict believe, between believers should be resolved. One-on-one, -on -one, in person, in love, with reconciliation in mind. Man, we're going to get on pretty well. And I believe this is exactly how it can happen if we simply obey God's word. See, unfortunately, what happens is that pride, misunderstanding, hard hearts, those sort of things, uh, they, they kind of get in the way sometimes. Eh? And too many are ready to listen to someone else's offense and to take up their battles. Sometimes we're on that end of the scale and we, somebody comes to us and says, I, I just want to bounce this thing off you. Or do you know what so-and-so did? you know what they said to me? I think they're very wrong in doing all of these things. This should never happen. The moment somebody comes to us with a complaint, we need to ask them, have you gone to that person? Not in a judgmental way. Some of us don't want to say that because then we, we look like the bad guy. I want to say the bad guy is the guy that doesn't follow the, the way of truth. And so actually we, we, we're doing something wrong to look like the good guy. That doesn't make sense. And, and be nice about it and say, you know what, the best way to do this I want to tell you from experience is, is don't tell me what this is all about. Go to that person and work it out. It, it's going to be better for everybody. And then pray for them that they can work it out. Stay on the wall. <laughs> you see, when, when somebody says, listen to my complaint, we say, oh no. I'm not going down to the plane of, oh, no, it's not going to happen. Uh, I strongly recommend that they go and speak to that person. See, when an offense is shared with somebody other than the offender, people get drawn into an illegitimate battle. Now they're involved where they shouldn't be, according to the truth of God's word. We get involved where we've not been called to get involved. I believe we should put relational integrity before criticism and gossip. Relational integrity should be there, way above. Even if you're a leader, even if you're a best friend, a spouse, a parent, the same principle applies. You see, one of the roles of leadership is to teach people to handle conflict well, not to get involved in the conflict, <laughs> to become mature. See, what happens, you've heard a friendly fire. And uh, some, some armies are more uh, prone to that than others. And this was a casualty of war, but it was their own people that shot them. And what happens is that there are casualties due to friendly fire. We get involved because we want to help, but we're not called to be involved. The intention is good, but then, they be, then there are casualties. So then what happens if the person doesn't listen? What happens if you can't work it out? I'm going to tell you what most of us would do. We just walk away. Why? Because that's what culture tells us. Because there is a culture of non-confrontation. We avoid conflict. I have heard numerous stories, numerous stories, where people have had issues with bosses at work or whatever. I just quit. I just walked away. Now, I'm not saying don't do that, but I'm saying don't do it in the kingdom. This is the kingdom. This is not the world. In the world, it's fine. Walk away. Do whatever you need to. If you don't want to approach that person, then don't. I, I, I think it's better that you do because it could also just be a misunderstanding. But if you don't want to, then it doesn't matter. But the problem is that culture filters into the life of the church. And we try to work something out with somebody and we can't work it out and we just walk away. I'm going to be the bigger person and walk away. No, no. I'm going to be the person that disobeys the word of God and I'm going to walk away. That, that's the reality of it. It's hard to hear it, because, but it's true. Because we're going to follow Jesus' teachings. You see, in the kingdom, we are committed to relationship, not being individualistic. 
Because in the world, we say, I'm going to walk away. Why? Because I'm looking after number one. I don't need that mental stress, that emotional stress. I don't need that thing in my life. I'm going to walk away, look after myself, get some me time, and do this thing. In the kingdom, it's no, it's our time. I'm going to stick in this thing because I'm going to fight for my brother and my sister. This relationship is important. In actual fact, the love that is shown between disciples distinguishes me as a follower of Jesus. I do not have the option of walking away. See, I need to be more committed to covenant relationship than the appearance of peace. Let me say that again. I need to be more committed to covenant relationship than the appearance of peace. Because when we walk away, there is no peace. Jesus guides us in this. Matthew 18, verse 16. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter might, may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So we take a couple of witnesses along. See, only once the olive branch has been rejected are one or two others involved. We're trusting that the first step actually works. And they've got to be valid witnesses, not allies to our cause. Okay, you can't take your best buddies along who are going to panel beat the other person into submission or whatever. That's, that's not what it's about. There's still no mention of leaders getting involved. Still nothing. Somebody, we get somebody that we trust. So, so Nathan and I have some issues. We don't really, but uh, as far as I know. But if, if, we, if we have issues, we try to work it out. We can't work it out. And we say, I say, listen, I, I'm really committed to this relationship. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get two people that I think aren't best friends with him or best friends with me. And uh, say to them, won't you just come? Uh, Nathan and I are having some problems just working something out. And just help us to work through this thing. Please pray about it. We'll get together on Thursday in my office or wherever, at your home or wherever it is. And we really want to work this thing out. Why? Because I'm committed to relationship. Because, because I love him. Because we want to work this out. I'm committed to the body. I'm committed to working this thing out. I'm trusting that reason would be seen. Maybe the witnesses say, actually, Brian, you've got this thing all wrong. You need to work this thing out differently. That's why they've got to be neutral people, not people. They're going to take my side no matter what. I believe they need to remain remote beforehand. Uh, the scripture doesn't suggest that we tell them our side of the story before we meet. Um, if we got to walk in the light, there's no secret meetings before and after. We, we have to be honest about it. This is the kingdom. It's not the world, it's the kingdom. Things work a little bit different. What's the aim? So the aim is repentance, reconciliation, and restoration, not justification. That's very, very important. This is not to justify. This is not to prove my point. If there's still no righteous response from the offender, if everybody there agreed that in actual fact this person did sin against you and they, they won't repent, this is something that has ramifications, and the witnesses say, we've heard it, and then, you know, actual fact, you, you, need to, you need to set this thing straight. No, I refuse. Jesus tells us what to do next. Matthew 18, verse 17. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Now, for some of us, we're cringing as we hear that and say, I never want to do that. Jesus would never have done that. Well, guess what? I think I'm going to stick with what the Bible says rather than our emotional response to these things. In love, with the hope of reconciliation. In love, in love. It has to be in love. Now it's the time for the eldership to get involved. The shepherds, they lead, they guide. It includes discipline. For many, it's like, oh, don't put out the dirty laundry. That's their private business. Yep, in the world, that's true. In the kingdom... We have some guidelines. I'm going to stick to the guidelines. This is why the series is called Truth. The search for truth, and the truth is found in the Word of God. It's a serious step, especially where sin is involved, but then it makes it an essential step. Absolutely essential. And here's the interesting thing, is that he says there, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, it's like there's four steps. 
Because first it's you, then it's you and witnesses, then it's the church, and then it's like we treat them like pagans. But it says, even if he refuses to listen to the church. Now, what does that mean? Now, I, I thought to myself, okay, so how, how do I interpret that? It involves everybody. So everybody's on his case now. Like his mom's saying to you, what is wrong with you? Can't you see that you're wrong? And his best buddy comes to him and says, come on, my buddy, let's do this. His wife says, my dear, you, you've got to see reason. Whatever it is, now the church is involved. Because it says here, if he does not listen to the church, then it is our responsibility as an entire body to get involved in somebody else's business, to see the body reconciled, healed, restored, that, 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 that love may overcome in this situation. It's not private business then. It starts off that way. But it's because we have the sense of community. We love each other. You know, sometimes you think, well, we go to a little small town with 500 people, and everybody knows everybody's business. Why? Because they rely on each other so much. If this guy refuses to trade with that guy or sell this thing today, there's going to be issues. And sometimes there are, but this is the kingdom. And so it implies that family members plead with their brother or sister to, to reconcile, to work this thing out, to come to their senses, that they pray for them, that they love them. And if that fails then Jesus does give us the next step. And let me tell you that no leader relishes this. No leader looks forward to saying, you know what, this person is no longer part of this body. In fact, as with every unbeliever, there needs to be a repentance, there needs to be an acknowledgement of sin, there needs to be an asking for forgiveness, then there's a restoration, there's the, and, that, and that's where they find themselves. Still with the door open to come back. Always with the door open to return. It doesn't seem right for us to cut ourselves off from members of the family, treating them as unsaved. But we always remain willing to reconcile, always loving, always full of grace. See, the people that Jesus is referring to would be those who are unsaved in our terms. And so there needs to be a repentance, a forgiveness, and a restoration for them to be part of the body again. See, the church is not everybody who sits on seats on a Sunday or watches something on YouTube. That, that's not the church. The church is the ecclesia, the called out ones, those that have a personal and ongoing relationship with Jesus, which started the day they died to self, rose again in Him, uh, uh, repented, were forgiven of their sins, and accepted Him as Lord and Savior. That's the church. We, we're not talking about people sitting in a building. We've, we've covered that ad nauseum in the past. And Jesus is their head. He is the head of the church, of all of those people. And this is what the head is saying. This is what we need to do. We know that physically, if my head says to me, pick up this bottle, but my hand doesn't want to do it, and it's kind of all over the place, then there, there's a medical reason for that. There's a disconnect between my head and my hand, and, and it needs to be, there needs to be some sort of repair taking place. Maybe some of the neurons are out. Maybe I've got a broken arm. I don't know. Something needs to be repaired. But generally speaking, my head's telling my body what to do. Friends, we walk in the light, in love and in grace. And obviously these steps take great integrity. They take great wisdom. They, they take a lot of prayer. Let me tell you, they take a lot of tears as well. But they have to be done. Why? Because we want to live in the truth. We want to be free. We want to be Jesus' disciples. We want to follow what He says. You see... One day, every believer will give an account for any idle word spoken. You and I, we will give an account for our gossip. The Bible tells us we will give an account for our idle words. For our idle words. We don't see room there for public debate and voting on membership and all of those sort of things. We see loving leaders appointed by God walking in front of His people. So once, we've, once it's taken place, we close the door on matter and we move on. Always hoping, always praying. We get back on the wall. We carry on with the work.
See, discipline is not a decision taken against a person. It's a decision taken for righteousness so that we live in the truth. It's applying biblical discipline to an issue. You see, what happens when we do our own thing, sometimes we weigh up the cost of applying the word to situations. We weigh it up. And then we decide it's too costly. It's too costly personally or it's too costly relationally. And when we apply Scripture partially, then we introduce additional issues, unresolved problems. We find ourselves only partially free. Remember Jesus' words said, if you hold to my teaching. Not if you consider them, weigh them up and do some of them. See, getting involved in illegitimate battles will take us from the task that God has given us. Not only to build what we can see, but also the things that we can't see. We want to continue to build the bond of love. We want to continue to build the relationship beyond our messages and our missions and our buildings and programs and all of those things. Part of building that wall is building relationship, building a, a friendship through love, covenant relationship, which includes confrontation at time. Otherwise, that relationship is not gelled. We've just walked away and it remains there. There's unforgiveness. We know what the, what the result of unforgiveness, like a poison in our, in our hearts. It affects us in many different ways. And so I want to challenge everybody today. So make a decision right now that we're going to obey Jesus' teachings. We're in a search for truth. We're in it together. We want to live by the truth because then ultimately we're going to be free. Don't entertain gossip. And don't gossip. Be firm, be loving, but stick to the word of God. Don't be the Pharisee that points fingers. But don't be the one that is too worried about the way we're going to look that we actually move into things that are ungodly. Apply His guidelines when you have an issue with somebody. Just do it. People say, why are you getting involved in my business? Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, I am. <laughs> that was right in the beginning. Yes, you are. Always keeping in mind the goal. And the goal is repentance, reconciliation, and restoration. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. We hope, we have faith that this thing's going to work out, but we continue to love at every level. At every level. Let's not get off the wall. Let's stay on the wall. Let's continue to do what God has called us to do. Let's not get involved in illegitimate battles. Let's stay out of those things that are not our concern, according to Scripture. And let's keep those things that are concern, that are our battles to fight, because we're fighting for one another. We're fighting for our brothers and our sisters, our homes, our children, and those include our relationship with them. If you're listening to this today and you think, man, there's something that I need to work out, make that decision. Decide right now, say, up. I'm actually going to work it out. When I finish speaking here, get on your phone, text somebody, call somebody, say, let's get together, let's work it out. Because, man, this, this relationship, this covenant bond between us is so important. It's absolutely essential. Father, I want to thank you that the word is actually pretty clear and that uh, it's, it's hard to follow these things. Lord, we, we, want to re we want to admit that these things are difficult. But Lord, the consequence of not following them is even more devastating. All sorts of factions and splits and division where they shouldn't be. I pray, Lord God, that we would be firm on these things. That uh, for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of the kingdom. And Lord, I pray that in all these things that we would soak it and wash it and cover it with love. That love does conquer all, but your love, Lord God, your agape love that includes doing the hard things, 
that includes confronting somebody. That includes trying to work things out for the king and the kingdom. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. So just a reminder, if you're watching this and you are part of the team that's going to be going out today or in the future to Buckridge, uh, we are going to be meeting today at 1 o'clock here at the church, so uh, 1 p.m. So uh, we'll see you then. Remember to pray. Remember to pray about the daycare grant application. And then on Saturday, we're having our elders' uh, planning time as well. All right, so the mess, the uh, the meeting is at 1:30, not at 1 p.m. And so, uh, if we can, if we can be here at that time. All right, have a wonderful week. Enjoy your day off on on Thursday, and God bless. Thank you.